roll back that baby so I'm too nauseous. That's where the audience is coming from. This, of course, is a phone on still somewhere. Third chapter, 
in the sixth verse. Malachi, the third chapter, the sixth verse, where it says, For I am Yahweh, I change not. Therefore, you, sons of Jacob, are not consumed or are not wiped off the face of the planet or are not wasted. Many believers hear these words, but somehow have little faith in them. I don't know why. Okay. They don't believe that anything can remain the same. Or they can remain the same. The concept of a thing never changing seems almost fear-inducing. Yet, God never changes. His plans are meticulously laid out. As we see in so many times in the Bible where in Exodus where he talked about how he wanted different things made and created and placed in the temple. And everything was with an exactitude. We become frustrated at some time. Yet, plans have been the same from the beginning, but the plans have been restructured as planned at every new phase of his eternal plan. It has always been so, yet each new phase is met with charges that something was changed. And each time something is restructured, the churches divide, and people choose up sides as to which change they want, rather than choosing to remain the same and do God's will. And move forward in God's will. That's why we're so stagnant right now, because so few of us want to do God's will. Oh, but if we do it this way, we'll have thousands of people here. We'll have lots of money. We'll be. Notice, this is how Sabbath turned to Sunday. This is how holy days turned to holidays. And we're suddenly being unnecessary and declared Jewish. They almost spit it out. You hear people say that sometimes. And they almost spit it out almost as if they're saying that inward as opposed to the jail. But so then when you teach hate, hate is hate. All of a sudden, as I said, holy days become holidays and somehow the law in many minds was done away. The Passover of the 14th suddenly became the 15th, or in some minds, Easter. And suddenly, the world of faith became far more complicated than was necessary. And the churches continued to divide and thought themselves to be pitted against the children of Israel, or the Israel of God. Yet, this is what Satan wanted. This, is, this was his plan. The confusion that we have found ourselves in pleases Satan because it was his plan to divide everyone so thoroughly that no one truly knew what God wanted. Notice, though, the initial plan of God for the church is laid out by Paul in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the first verse. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the first verse, where it says, I am therefore the prisoner of the Lord, beseech or beg you. It was the only time he did it to you. I beseech you that you walk worthy of the wherewith you were called, with all lowliness and meekness, 
and with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. As opposed to splitting and starting a new church and denomination every, with every new disagreement, and then within that group, there's more disagreements and more splits. And if you start with one, next thing you know, you got five times. And most of it are disagreements over some arcane point of doctrine that no one is sure about, but they're so sure that they're right in their wrongness or their unsureness. That's how we got where we are now. And not just the church of God, everyone. We're not pointing fingers, we're pointing hands. Upward for guys. You see, Paul further challenges us to remain centered in love, according to the initial hope of our calling to live in peace with the Godhead as our head, bringing eventually all of us together as one. And believe it or not, before it's all over with, He will have His way with us. Continuing at the split of verse 2, endeavoring to keep the unity of spirit in the bond of there's one body and one spirit. Even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God, the Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Through the earnest portion of the Holy Spirit given to us all at our baptism, Seven says, but every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of God. To the degree we have fed that spirit with healthy things through our lifestyle and hope for God. It has led us according to Yeshua's grace. Now, of course, if it's not leading you, you have no idea what he's talking about. Verse 8. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to me. That would be that spirit within him and the ability to make it into his kingdom. Verse 9. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heaven that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. All of this for the perfecting of the saints. For the word of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. In other words, unto that word implies that we're not there yet. Unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Messiah. We must all come to an understanding of the word of God in the way of Yeshua. You see, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you heard. And I'm sure you heard all of this, but there's only going to be one kingdom of God. There's not going to be a black kingdom of God. So dismiss that. There's not going to be a white kingdom of God. So dismiss that. There's not going to be an Episcopalian kingdom of God. There isn't going to be a Baptist kingdom of God. There isn't going to be a Lutheran kingdom of God. There isn't going to be a Catholic kingdom of God. Good luck trying to convince them of that, but it's not 
and be that way. If we're going to make it onto that sea of glass to be waved, and yes, this is where we will wind up, if the book is correct, about the next phase of plan regarding this day. And I saw nothing in that plan about the vision being acceptable in the Bible. We will come as one in the name and the word of God. Or we will not make it in. We must increase our knowledge of the word of God and accept it as one. You see, the holy days of God are a picture and a map of his plan of salvation. But each change causes some confusion because people want to say, oh, he changed something. No. He moved some things around so that it would remain in line. But we'll see that as we go through it. Yet, no change, as you'll see, was necessary. Now, if we read the entire book, and no, we don't have time to do that today, so relax. We're not going to do that today. But we will dig more deeply into one point of confusion because it is just that. <coughs> For our title today, Yeshua, our first fruits, our hope in Pentecost.
keeping them from reading the Bible, but trusting the wisdom of men on this, the confusion continues. The end of the correct account will place us, if done properly, at the correct day for Pentecost. We will see that this is of utmost importance. Notice and make notes if possible because we believe this is. Leviticus, the, third, the 23rd chapter, the ninth verse. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you be come into the land which I give you, and shall reap the first harvest thereof, then you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh to be accepted for you. And on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave. And you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf, a he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto Yahweh. Even if no weekly Sabbath was to come, this waving was to come on the 16th of the for the Israelites. The day after was the first day of unleavened bread. However, for New Testament believers, the Sabbath will generally fall within the day of unleavened bread. Now, has anyone ever seen a year when the Sabbath did not fall within a seven-day period during the days of unleavened bread? Please raise your hand, and I want to talk to you. Okay, we said that. In the end, or in the evening of this end of the week, we Sabbath, during the days of unleavened bread, the count to pe the Pentecost will usually begin. But a warning came from Yahweh concerning the eating of grain, and for a very, very rare and forward-looking reason that is now much more clear than it was when it was given. I'm not even sure that the Israelites understood what it was for, because it wasn't really so much yet. For them. Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, let's go to the 14th verse. And here is where it gets interesting. So you got to follow close to the end. 23rd chapter of Leviticus, the 14th verse, where it says, And you shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the selfsame day that you have brought an offering unto your God. In other words, you don't feed yourself. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generation and all your dwellings. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, the seventh Sabbath shall you number fifty days. And you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. You shall bring out of your habitation, notice the change here, two wave loads, big bread loads, of two tenth deal. They shall be made of fine flour. They shall be baked with leather. And they are the first fruits unto the Lord. Now here, the common rule that's in verse 14 was that no grain was to be eaten until the sheaves or wheat were brought before the priests and weighed by the priests before Yahweh. However, it appears that two defining exceptions were made, bridging the Old Testament law, making the way for the New Testament waving of Yeshua. Notice what happens during the first Passover and days of unleavened bread in the promised land. Let's go to Joshua, the fifth chapter, the tenth verse.
Joshua, the fifth chapter, the tenth verse, where it says, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the fourteenth day. Nothing strange here. You know what they were told? The fourteenth day of the month of evening in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat. What up? And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the self same day, which was at that point the 15th of Abib. Hey, wait a minute. For those who caught that, we'll get shot back. But that's the matter here. And the matter ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. The morrow in which the manna disappeared was the 16th of Abim. Neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Now, this is where it gets interesting. The cessation of manna from Yahweh was his acceptance of their eating of the fruit of the land one day early. Why? Because of the dull Sabbath which occurred here. Yep. Joshua, having been in lockstep with Yahweh, would never have allowed the children of Israel to eat the old corn prior to his waiting, save for a very special reason, especially in his first leadership endeavor after assuming the mantle of Moses. Imagine what God would have done to him if he had, in the first day, decided, let's try something different. <laughs> Imagine if he tried that in his first attempt of leading the Israelites into the promised land. This was their first keeping for the Passover in the days of under the reign under Joshua since leaving Egypt. Let's go to Joshua, the first chapter, the first verse. Joshua, the first chapter, the first verse, where it says, And it happened after the death of Moses, the servant of Yahweh. Yahweh spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, my servant Moses is dead. And now, rise up, cross over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your feet shall tread, I have given it to you. As I spoke to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon even to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and the great sea toward the setting of the sun shall be your borders. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you, nor will I forsake you. Be strong and brave, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very brave, so that you may take heed to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may act wisely wherever you go. And would you, if you were working for God, would the first thing you do change it? So. You see, uh, this early eating of the fruit of the land was disobedience. It would have been noted in the Bible and would have been punished in Scripture. But this was not the case because this Sabbath in Joshua 5 10 was a double Sabbath. The first, God, it's amazing how God does that. Before they even embark on it, Let's clear up all man's problems right away. 
He starts off the first day of unleavened bread on a double Sabbath, which ends the whole idea that there's no Sabbath between them. Of course there was a good start on the first day, and it was a lot. A weekly Sabbath, as well as the 15th of the week, you see, in which case, in order to avoid delay of the count of Pentecost, the priests were and are allowed to wave the sheep on the 15th and allow the people to, one, eat the fruits of the land, and two, begin to count to Pentecost in the evening after this double Sabbath, thus the importance of getting the timing right. And God guaranteed that we could do it right, provided, and here's the problem, that we listen to him. And how do we listen to him? By reading the Bible. You see, this was set in motion before the New Testament complications that many wrestle with now concerning the Sabbath within the days of unleavened bread. The way of sheep complication has been cleared by an allocation of an early way of sheep on the day after a double Sabbath, on the first day of unleavened bread. There's no other circumstance which would preclude the normal Sabbath calculation during the days of unleavened. Others insist, although they don't see anything other than the Bible, they see things that they can attach to and say, well, that's what that really means. And that's the only trick in the book. Everybody's been doing that. But it doesn't work if you know the book. But they say that you have to count the entire three day wait after you shoot the burial before you can start to count. And it must be observed yearly this way in order to correctly count. Correctly. This is not biblical. It is not found in the scriptures, not in any concrete form. And the actual death and hanging of Yeshua on a Wednesday guaranteed the timing of his resurrection to come just at the time of the wave sheep, which came after the weekly Sabbath of 30 or if someone already 31 AD. Both years they felt the same. Nothing changed. It was no coincidence that the actual martyrdom, burial, and resurrection fell into the same time period set in motion by God and Christ from the dawn of time. Having already arisen, this count is not necessary on a yearly basis. What does it say in Hebrews 10th chapter, the ninth verse? Hebrews 10th chapter, the ninth verse, where it says, Then said he, Lo, I will come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first. Well, he takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Yeshua, the Messiah, once for all. It's say every to once for all. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemy be made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. So what are you waiting three days for? It's already been done. Verse 15. Whereof the Holy Spirit also will witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after these days, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. The Joshua 5 early waving and cessation of the man for the Israelites at Gilgal proved that the precedent prefigured the way of sheep before its fulfillment in Yeshua. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the 21st. Give a little bit more. 
First Corinthians, the 15th chapter, 21st verse, where it says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become what? The first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in all in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Amen. The waving of the wave sheet was planned from the dawn of time, prefiguring the martyrdom, death, and resurrection of Yeshua Messiah. As a point of clarity, this is why no one was allowed to touch Yeshua before he went before the Father, to be waved in his encounters with his early brethren before his ascension. Let's go to John, the 20th chapter, 16th verse. John, the 20th chapter, 16th verse, where it says, Yeshua said unto her, speaking of Mary, so unto Mary she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Yeshua said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father. In other words, once I leave you, I'm going. And your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. After he had gone before the Father, he returned and was held, touched, worshipped, and otherwise by his disciples and other believers because at that point he had been waiting. This was proof of his waiting. At this point, he could be touched. But there's an element that is often overlooked. You see, the Hebrews have always kept the feast of weeks or shabbos, as they call it. Some of the Antics actually keep Pentecost and understand well the linkage to shabbos. But the two will emerge in the end. You see, God's plan is He knows that there was going to be division. He knew there were going to be strife. He knew there were going to be problems. That's why. It took us a long time to get there. But we finally have reached the point where it's not necessary to bite the hand that in this case feeds you. You get to a point where you can be disagreeing but not be disagreeable. You reach that point where you can sit and discuss things and not walk away saying, I never want to talk to this one again because <laughs> you've heard me. We've all been there. We've all been there. And some of it was our fault. That's why things are as they are now. There's so many divisions and so many splits, and I don't want to talk to this one, and this one doesn't want to go over there, and I don't. In that nonsense now, and avoid the rush. Because we're all going to be one when it's all over. Whether we want to or not. In fact, the matter is, if we don't want to, guess what? There's a nice, warm place for you to relax while you wait. <clears throat> but as I said, the two will merge in the end. Notice in more detail the instructions given by God. And let's have that there. Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. 15 verse. I think that will kind of watch over here, but we're going to put some flesh on it this time. Should I say we're going to put a little heat on it? We're going to make it. The Vedic is the 23rd chapter, 15 verse, where it says, You shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh shall you number 50 days. And you shall offer a new meat offering unto Yahweh. You shall bring out of your habitation. Now notice what is brought out as an offering now. You shall bring out of your habitation 
two wave loaves, not grain, baked bread. Two wave loaves of two tenths deal. They shall be of fine flour, they shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto Yahweh. Verse 18, you shall offer with the bread, makes it very clear, seven lambs without blemish of the first year, and one young bullock and two rams, and they shall be for a burnt offering unto Yahweh with their meat offering and their drink offerings, and even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto Yahweh. Notice how the symbols and instruments of sacrifice morph with it. The weighing of wheat, sheaves, or bowls of grain, along with the unblemished lamb, were offered to Yahweh by the priest. God does not accept the weighing sheep offering unless it is accompanied by the sacrifice of a lamb without blemish. This lamb was symbolize the Yes, Yeshua, the Lamb of God. Our acceptance by the Father is predicated on the works of Christ, who atoned for our sins, thereby making us acceptable in the eyes of the Father. The Pentecost of the Feast of Weeks offering of seven lambs and two loaves, two loaves of fresh, freshly but baked bread the bread represents our lives in Yeshua. Anybody else here ever baked bread? No one here can say that they have not suffered some loss as a result of sincerely following this way of life. Those who are just kind of young out and going to fans. Talk about you, don't just talk about the talk. But the reward will more than make up for any and all the loss. You see, after all, it was all done to the glory of God and His kingdom, which will never end. And with Job, all that you have lost in this cause, you will gain it back many times. Oh yeah, we're served, we're pushed, we're beaten, and after we're shaped in a shape that we may not want to be in, we're thrown into heat and fire up. And sometimes your life can feel like you're on fire, on fire, being burned. But if you stay in this way of life, it sometimes feels like it gets a little bit harder than 350, if you know what I'm talking about. It can get hard. It can get tougher. Family comes at you from one side. Job comes at you from another one. Your bills never stop. It's not, it's not even a thing of how much of it helps you, or how much of it hurts you, or how much of it is your own fault. We all go. Some of it is just the way of the world, some of it is the way of us. It is hard to sit here or stand here and say, that was your fault, that was something else. No, that's not my job. My job is just to forecast the weather, not to rent it. We've all gone through something. But let's go to 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. First Corinthians, the third chapter, 15 verse, where it says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know that not that you are the know you not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy. And 
And that's not to say that he won't allow you to destroy yourself by the things that you do that you think feel good. The temple of God is whole. Which temple you are. Let not man deceive himself. If any man among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. But this wisdom of this world is foolishness of God. For it is written, he takes the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in me, or women for that matter. For all things are yours, if you ride the track to the stage of the stage. All things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Kephas or the world or death or life or things present or things to come, all are yours. Why? The answer comes in 23. For you are Christ, and Christ is God, and he's lost no one. He said, save for son issue. This thing has always been important to God in the history of his people. Every major change in the lives of the people of God has become on this day more significant. In Exodus 19 and 20, Yahweh had Moses tell the Israelites to first wash their clothes and assemble them at the foot of Mount Sinai. For in three days he would show himself in the fire. And they would hear the voice of Yahweh. Exodus 19, chapter 18, verse. Exodus 19, chapter 18, verse, where it says, In Mount Sinai, it spoke all of it, because Yahweh came down upon it in the fire. And the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked great. of the trumpet sounded long and became very strong. Moses spoke and gave answer by the voice. I wonder if those folk out there on the West Coast are feeling any of this right now. I don't know if anybody knew about it, but the West, but there's been like a 24 quake that's been going constantly since Thursday. Never heard of that before. Constant rumbling for two days. Never heard of that. What's happening? I wonder how many feel right now. Verse 20. And Yahweh called down from Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. And Yahweh called Moses to the top of the mountain. Moses went up along with Aaron. No other priests or people were allowed to touch the mountain. But when the law was given, all of the people agreed to abide by it. The next gathering of God's people came at the Jerusalem temple. Yeshua had already told his disciples to remain near Judea as he would give them power through the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Acts, the first chapter of the 31st. Acts, the first chapter of the third verse, where it says, To him, to whom he also presented himself, living his suffering by many infallible truths, being seen by them for 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. In other words, imagine being taught for 40 days by the Messiah himself. The notes he had, if you even needed them, it might have been burned into your mind somehow. Just think about that. Just roll that around in your mind. Verse 4, and having met with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to await the promise of the Father, which you heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. If he was with them for 40 days, and it could only be what? Nine or ten days or so before Pentecost would come at this point. 
Verse 6. Then he, these coming together, they asked him, saying, Lord, do you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the season which the Father has put in his own authority. It's an interesting one, but it is him. Notice how quickly he jabbed back there. It's not for you to know. He did this once before and then turned around again. Anybody remember when he was at the wedding at Canaan? When Mary asked him to perform a miracle, yet he performed it, turning water into wine, but we find this in. John, the second chapter, the first verse. But I want you to notice this because it, it's an interesting little hint. Very interesting. Such was the faith that they suddenly had. 
seeing Yeshua risen solidified and bolstered the apostles' faith until their deaths. All beginning on this day in Herod's temple at Jerusalem, as they were told to remain there. Let's go to Acts, the second chapter. Peter, 
Then you had 3,000 people come forth. And now with this power in the air, all around, miracles were occurring. We're so used to TV and technology, now we get miracles and we go off and do what we want to do. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. They didn't say anything about anybody stealing from anybody. They just did what it did. Everybody put their hands together. Now, the political one called that communism. Oh, that's communism where everybody puts it all together, but they don't say anything about Wall Street, but that's all Christian. But we put everybody to put that stuff together because they were in a hot situation. The Romans weren't happy about this. They didn't want this. And they were looking for a reason to kill these people off. And they had basically, well, they killed off their leaders, so now it was well, just a matter of time, they'll fall apart. But with these miracles, it seemed to make them stronger. It took until 70 AD before they finally had to go in and level that tone. Verse 46, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. In other words, it wasn't just 3,000. More were coming in every day. Having come to conversion, they sold their belongings and lived as one big happy family. All of this in Judea, where the Romans still had absolute glory and had little respect for this new sect of believers slurred as Christians. <laughs> now many continue to concern themselves with whether Yeshua will come on and he calls for trumpets. I'll just say that it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But whichever day, if we are not ready, I wouldn't worry about it. You're not going to be there. If you're not doing what Yeshua told us to do, if we're not where Yeshua told us to be, and the big hint is that it's entirely possible that the place of safety may be as simple as your church home on Pentecost. You're out of black walking in so you might not make it. Like the ten virgins. The wise virgins were ready. The foolish ones. Maybe somebody can tell us something that makes more sense than that. I don't, I don't believe that. You see, if we're not where Yeshua told us to be, if we're lukewarm in our approach to his word, and I say maybe, don't worry about it. For it may be the worst day of our lives when it does finally come. Because why? You didn't believe me, but you live in your own way, you're going out, done your thing, and taste it up, and it didn't happen, but things happen. And sometimes we think we know better when we know nothing. Second Peter, the second chapter, the second verse. No, let's go down to the 20th verse. Second Peter, the 20th verse. Second Peter, the second chapter. The 20th verse. 2 Peter, the second chapter, the 20th verse, where it says, For if, after they have, this, have this escaped the defilement of the world through the knowledge of the Master and Savior, Yeshua Messiah, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them. 
where it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment and live to them. What the true Bible, what the true proverb says has happened to them. Dog returns to its own fight. And the sow, after washing herself, returns to wall. Let's go to Hebrews, the sixth chapter of the fourth verse. Hebrews, the sixth chapter of the fourth verse, which says, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the power of this age to come, and have fallen away to restore them. It is impossible to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God with their own harm and holding them up to contempt. For the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed. And its end, if it does not change, is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work and, and love as you have shown for his name and serving the saints as you do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the same full assurance of hope until the end. And if you're going to do that, that means that God says, be at this place, you're there. If he says to do this, you're going to do that. If he says put all your money together and do that. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you to do something like that. I know guys, that we've heard these stories over years. Oh, everybody, there's a, there's a comet coming. So we'll stand on the top of the mountain with our hands raised and we'll be lifted up to the comet. Where's that in Bible? <laughs> oh, everybody go and stand on the corner of Smart Circle, on the third whatever, and stand on your head to God will come and lift us all up. Where is that in the Bible? Well, I'll go to the Blackhawk game. When they win in the third, in the second overtime period, we'll all be raised up. I don't think so. If it's going to happen, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen here. It's going to happen right here. Or wherever his people are. I believe that's that place of safety Talk about Petra. Now these are rocks, right? These are some nice rocks. But it's not Petra. I believe wherever he told us to be, when he told us to be there, if we're there, we're all right. But if we're not there, you missed the bus. This is the day we have waited. But we must continue in faith and strength in order to be waiting on this day as fully baked bread, the first fruits of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. I don't know if you are as hungry as I am. God bless you all. Let's eat. <laughs>